Please give a warm welcome to our hosts for today, Edie Lush and Ben Thompson. Hello. Welcome to all of you, your excellencies, honorable guests and ladies and gentlemen. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called this UK India Week a catalyst for forging new trade ties, lasting collaborations and a better future for us all. I'm excited to be here with you. My name is Edie Lush. And I'm Ben Thompson. A very warm welcome to you all. For those of you who are new here, you are most welcome. It is wonderful to have you with us. For those of you who we are seeing again, welcome back. This year is bigger, it's busier and better than ever before. Um, so much so, the Prime Minister of India has celebrated the role that these events play in bringing the opportunities of India to a global audience. Last week, in his speech to the US Congress, Prime Minister Modi spoke about the battles of passions, persuasion and policy. We'll be bringing you passionate and persuasive debate today. We'll knit together the threads of business, economics and politics, and of course, a sprinkling of entertainment as well. Of course we will. Uh, our thread today is leading with purpose, and it is our job up here to lead you through the conversations, the discussions and the debates that we will hold today uh, as we bring India to the world and of course the world to India. And we want you, the audience, to be involved as well. Join the conversation online using the hashtag UKIndiaWeek. Share with us your thoughts and comments. So let us begin with a very special conversation between the two men who are charged with nurturing and developing and growing the special bond that already exists between the UK and India. Please do welcome to the stage His Excellency Vikram Doriswamy, the High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom. And His Excellency Alexander Ellis, the British High Commissioner to India. Welcome. Welcome to you both. Please grab a seat. Right. There's, there's a gap there. Don't fall. <laughs> yes. Mind the gap. Yes. It's like being at the tube station. <laughs> uh, Your Excellency's welcome. Lovely to have you with us to kick off what is a really busy afternoon of debate and discussion. Um, and Vikram, let me start with you because you are both at different ends of the same relationship, aren't you? You're relatively new in the role. Um, and I wonder how you would characterize the state of that UK-India relationship right now. This is a unique relationship. It is one that, is, that has, of course, its uh, foundations in history, but it is much more than just a relationship based in history. Uh, you have 1.8 million people of Indian origin uh, who have flourished and, successed, uh, flourished and created success and wealth in this country. You have, uh, I should say it, I suppose, uh, a prime minister of Indian origin. Uh, you have uh, a relationship in which um, your language is also our language. It is the language of official communication, but it is also a language in which rather more Indians speak it than in most other countries in the world put together. Uh, it is a relationship that has the prospect of great stuff in the future, uh, including, I dare say, uh, opportunities for us to partner with each other on the great issues of the day, from climate change to finding technology-based solutions for humanity's problems. So it's a relationship with the past, the present, and a fantastic future. And as, oh. I was going to say, in the job, what, just nine months now, Vikram, what has been your biggest surprise, quickly, before we move on? Ha. Well, many things to be surprised about, I suspect. <laughs> but um, one of them being the fact that there is so much openness in the UK for a much stronger relationship with India mm. at all levels. Yeah. Uh, from government to parliament, business, academia. In fact, I assumed it would be a lot of work in trying to, you know, interest people in the relationship. It seems I'm pushing on an open door. Mm, interesting. Alex, what about you? What's changed about the UK-India relationship since the end of Brexit transition period right. 2020? I mean, a lot, uh, not least I became High Commissioner. <laughs> um, uh, it is... The UK doesn't have a choice. It has to go big on India, in my view. Um, India is extremely attractive. It's also quite challenging. 
Uh, and I think there's always been a little bit of hesitation in the UK, not amongst this audience, I should say. But now the feeling is we have to do this. Um, and I think there was a very clear signal sent by the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And I think there's been a con continuity about that. We'll obviously have Sir Keir Starmer speaking here after this. The sense that there's a collective interest in uh, uh, having a much bigger and broader relationship with India, which is forward looking. Uh, the, the art is converting the desire into reality. And there I think we still got a bit of work to do. But I see a determination on that on defence, I see it on sustainability, I see it on trade, I see it on the political relationship as well. So still a bit of work to do. So what are the challenges? The challenges are, uh, number one, um, risk. Uh, this country, the United Kingdom, is going to have to adapt to risk in the future because the future lies in India and in countries like India. And that's a tougher place. I was ambassador to Portugal, relatively easy place, lovely country. My wife is from Portugal, so I'm always afraid of it. <laughs> um, but India is tougher and requires more time, more energy, and an acceptance of risk. Now, that risk is lowering. I think the Prime Minister Modi and his government are very clear about that. We can help from the British government. So there just has to be a determination we're in it for the long run. And I think you have that now in the UK, but you need to start to really make it real. Uh, and Vikram, this is a relationship built on society. It's built on culture. But fundamentally, this is about business. And we're here today to talk about primarily those business relationships too. And I wonder, if you look at the statistics, um, the astonishing growth in business between the UK and India in recent years. What is it that those businesses want? And, and this is a, a two-way relationship quite clearly, but what about UK owned, uh, Indian owned businesses in the UK? What is it that they're asking you for? What do they say they need access to? Well, frankly, Indian, Indian businesses here have done extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. There are, as per the last report that CII had commissioned with Grant Thornton, uh, something like 950 Indian businesses here. Yeah. What is surprising is how little people seem to know about it uh, in both countries. And yet employing, what, 100,000 staff? Uh, over 100,000 yeah. staff. Um, the top 10 Indian companies alone employ about 100,000 people. Uh, so Indian companies are the second largest investors in the UK. And obviously what they're looking for here isn't just uh, the market, but also all that goes around with it, the quality of services, the, uh, the technology opportunities here the opportunity to, to, to build branding in the, in, in the UK, because the UK still has a huge ability to set global narrative standards, uh, and use that as a springboard to further international expansion. That is huge. But the other way around also, I'd say the India opportunity is also a strong one. Indian businesses are now ambitious. They're looking for global opportunities. Partnerships with Indian businesses in the Indian market, which is changing since uh, since 2014 at a degree and a pace that has been unprecedented in particular i'd like to say in the rural areas you know it's an interesting thought just to, just for those of you in the digital business something like 300 million people are on the internet in rural india alone mm. so just see the scale of opportunity that that creates uh, for british businesses looking to offer new services or new products for a new market but you also mentioned that they'd like to, those Indian businesses in the UK would like to use this as a place for international expansion. Surely they're also looking for better access to the single market. What do they ask you about Brexit? Ha. Well, frankly, that's a conversation they should largely have with the British government. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but my own what take- What do you hear from them? Uh, my, own, my own take on this one would be that uh, British, uh, Indian businesses are good at figuring out uh, price and technology opportunities uh, across the board. Uh, they have already built up partnerships, including sales and value partnerships across continental Europe. So those bits are working in any case. The fact that many of our largest automotive, automotive manufacturers have preferred this market suggests that there is an opportunity for us to not just look at the UK as a springboard to Europe, but also to the rest of the globe, including, including uh, North America, but also Africa and other parts of Asia, to, to qualitatively scale up the product. If you were looking for a Frankly, if you're looking for a low-wage opportunity or a low-cost opportunity, then they wouldn't be coming here. Mm. They're looking for, for the UK as a high-quality base opportunity to, to export abroad. So that gives us, I think, an opportunity to offset mm. the advantages and disadvantages of both countries. Um, so, Alex, if they're not coming here for access to the single market, they might want a free trade deal. 
Um, we know they are notoriously difficult to agree. There's so much detail that needs to be ironed out. But why does it take so long? I mean, what are we at? Tenth round of negotiations right now? Yeah, that's not surprising. A trade deal uh, takes usually a couple of years. You should do within a couple of years. And I think we'll either do it by the end of this year or we won't do it, or at least it won't be done for some time. What are uh, the sticking points? Uh, sticking points are... I mean, I, we could rattle through them endlessly, but essentially we are now to the end game of the negotiations, and I speak carefully, one, two people in the audience know these negotiations very well. <laughs> At some point, it comes down to political will. Are you prepared to make the leap which needs to be made? Um, there will always, these are two very differently shaped economies, different size, I mean, the same size, but so differently shaped, so that takes a bit of getting used to. Um, UK has never negotiated a trade of this kind with a country of that sort of shape of economy. For India, relatively new, back into the FTAs. Some one, now one with Australia, one with the UAE. So, uh, and there are always issues around goods, services, but if you're negotiating numbers, you can get a deal. Um, the question is whether you can avoid sort of sticking points of principle. But it, in the end, it will require political determination. And that's why I go back to my earlier point. I think that we, we have to do this. I think there's a very powerful signal for the UK and India to do a free trade deal. First of all, in terms of lowering tariffs and so forth, that's great, and open more access for services. But secondly, it sends a signal to businesses about the comfort of doing business in each other's countries. Now, that is growing very fast, as Bikram has said, but I think we could do more on that. Finally, there is a strategic element to it. It is a signal to the world that two of the biggest democracies in the world are able to do a trade deal, and it's about more, it's about business, but it's about much more than that, I think. I'd, I'd want to echo that last point particularly. I think sometimes when you do these deals, it's easy to forget that the purpose of it isn't just about increasing the export of, I don't know, mangoes from, from India to here or, you know, uh, whiskey from there to here, good as these are. Uh, and certainly there is a, a reasonably large market for whiskey, as we discover. Uh, uh, the, the challenge really is in recognizing how complex the fit really is. The UK is, uh, as an economy, as the way it has evolved over the centuries, is much more integrated into the global system, into the value chains of production globally. India just isn't. We are increasingly integrated, but there are complexities. India also is an economy that exists in multiple centuries at the same time. You cannot expect that these two economies will naturally integrate across all, board, all sort of you know, uh, areas of goods and services easily. But the deal is to be had, and I mean a great deal is there to be had, in the sense that the opportunity that India offers the UK and the opportunity that the UK offers India, as I said, particularly as a standard setting country, are colossal. And these really do need to be picked up. And as Alex said, I think we are now at the point where uh, the last issues really will be nailed when uh, at, the, at the senior most levels of leadership, we decide, all right, we need to spend political capital on this and make it go. Yeah. Interesting. So I'd love to finish just having a little sneak peek into the um, ins and outs of your job on a day-to-day -day basis. I loved seeing you uh, leading the asanas at, at Trafalgar Square for International <laughs> Day of, of Yoga. Also loved seeing that at, at the United Nations set a Guinness World Book of Records. World Book of Records. Um, what's the, the balance between hard and soft power in, in your job? Him or me? <laughs> you go first, first <laughs> um, Look, I'd say the, um, the simple point here is that in a place like the UK, both coexist. Mm. And they must coexist well for you to be able to be successful in a diplomatic uh, mission. Mm. Um, India's soft power, of course, lies in its history, its culture, its civilizational values. And of course, in something uh, quite as sort of self-contained as yoga, which captures all of this, but it also lies in the value that Indian people bring to, bring to the relationship. Uh, our student community, 145,000 students in this country, our businesses, as I mentioned, 950 businesses up here, uh, the quality of services. We have some of our finest hotels here, and a lot of Indians are in the hotel businesses out here. So, you know, there is a nice way in which India gets badged with all of this, and I think that's that's a good place if, if, you know, the sense is that Indians are associated with, uh, with technology, with service, with uh, hospitality, uh, with yoga and wellness. I think these are great pieces to put together and to package along with the rest of the relationship, which is, of course, about the fortunately not so hard trade-offs that we have in our relationship. These are easy trade-offs because the relationship is a great one. 
Alex, what about you? What's, how's your tree pose, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Not for demonstrating now. <laughs> uh, One time uh, I did make Manoj actually demonstrate <laughs> tree pose on stage during International Day of Yoga. Uh, but w what's the equivalent for you? What's the equivalent of, of International Day of Yoga the soft power in, of the Britain in, the, in India? Well, Joss Butler, I think, is the simple <laughs> answer to that. Um, uh, the greatest uh, one-day batsman in the world. Um, uh, uh, I'm not going to try and imitate a, a ramp shot. Um, the, uh, it, is, it is a mixture of the hard and the soft. It's why I love my job, because you get to do both. And some of it's, you have to have the hard stuff, the hard power. That includes, you know, our, our, our aircraft carrier group coming out to India. It includes a lot of work together on the armed forces and cyber and all this kind of stuff. And you need the soft as well. India has this fantastic culture. And there's something very interesting that happens when Britain encounters Indian culture, whether it's anything from, you know, George Harrison to uh, Joss Butler. There's something very uniquely creative about that. And when the two come together, and I always go back to the example of the COVID shield vaccine, you know, you some UK innovation uh, started in a great university and then spread across the world with Indian manufacturing might. Something very great happens as a result of that. That's why the potential of the partnership is there. And our job is to turn that into reality. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Bikram Doraswamy, the High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom, and His Excellency Alexander Ellis, the British High Commissioner to India. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Leave you with one last thought. Yeah. It doesn't just have to be about chicken tikka masala. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheers. All right. Thanks.